Good afternoon, everyone. Jack Ma in disguise as a disgraced billionaire visiting Dutch Agricultural Research Institute. They're talking about agriculture, infrastructure, plant breeding, Bayer launching new tomato variety, blight free in almost all conditions, materials to build out greenhouses like that's really expensive. Enter Alibaba, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, all for, you guessed it, agriculture. Robotic hydroponics is the way to go. The most density in the smallest amount of space, all computer driven. And don't forget those robots that'll move the lettuce around for you. Facilities like this, expensive, but the amount of money going into AI research, as well as cloud computing for agriculture, the most cost effective with the highest output. Right now it's focused on lettuces, but the micronutrients in superfoods, but it's going to require grains, proteins, and superfoods and nutrient delivery in the smallest package possible. Less humans will be here, more automation. You can already see it. The art of war. You think China's really going to run out there and say, hey, Jack Ma's here to help revamp all the agriculture for the entire world, and we're going to produce all the products for that changeover. I don't think so. New studies show that by the time people reach their middle ages, the body often produces less than half of the collagen it did in their youth. Collagen is the main building block in our skin, making up 70 to 80 percent of it. This is why we get sagging skin and wrinkles as we age. If you want to look younger, you must supplement collagen, which will improve your skin's elasticity, make it smoother, more plump, and more youthful looking. That's why Ageless Multi-Collagen provides five key types of collagen you need from four different sources, essential to optimally support an array of full-body benefits. No odor, no taste, no clumping, unlike other collagen supplements. And this is why I recommend... Health with Adapt2030.com, Ageless Multicollagen, a quick way for youthful appearance. Use the link in the description box below for 51% off my favorite Ageless Multicollagen. And now on with the video. Gonna start you right over here. Jack Ma visiting the Dutch Agricultural Research Institute. And apparently he is the go-between for agricultural infrastructure and plant breeding programs. Now, what this tells me is the Chinese government, the CCP, understands food is a main issue. Every grand solar minimum, Chinese dynasties collapse. CCP can't come directly out and say, hey, we're going to try to reinvent the food growth system across the planet using robotics, artificial intelligence, now, they have to use Jack Ma as a quote-unquote disgraced billionaire. But knowing the art of war, think about that for a second. Jack Ma has everything in play from Alibaba to possibly bring China through semi-unscathed in this grand solar minimum, locking his name in history as a person who helped save China. That's legacy beyond legacy. The money is meaningless any longer. So perhaps it's a giant stage play that we're seeing. CCP is going after all this tech companies at the moment. Have you noticed? All those resources are being re-diverted. So what are the resources at hand that the CCP has to help bring food and stability back to China during these uncertain times? Because if we do travel off to the Dutch Institute for Agriculture, this is what they are brewing up for indoor Buildings and apartment buildings, office buildings, disused office space, parking garages, etc. Taking a look at a couple other ideas there, what they have for indoor agriculture, some of it vertical, some of it what you see here. But again, you're talking about millions of dollars to build this small space. And what we're seeing so far is just lettuce and sort of leafy greens being grown with a huge amount of capital expenditure to get these up and running, if you will. So tomatoes here. I stumbled across this article in Kenya after I was linked out from the Dutch Agricultural Institute who's sponsoring the research with Bayer into this blight-resistant tomato species. And wouldn't you know, 
Blight is one of the main things referred through history that has wiped out and caused famine for many, many crops and civilizations through history. Now, what we need to do is take a look at where the yields are. Now, if you look at vertical hydroponics or vertical agriculture, things stacked on top of each other, the yields are kind of low, even for what would be lettuces. We'll refer to this as romaine or any types of leafy veg. But if you're bringing over into hydroponics, you'll see that the yield substantially jumps. And it's the only way that tomatoes can be grown in addition to possible target species of higher value, not just thinking strawberries. Because in realistic terms, we're still going to need grains, superfoods, and proteins to move our society forward. Now, I know what's happening with Jack Ma here is they're in the discovery build-out phase of bringing agriculture indoors, all automated. So what do we really need to feed humans and also keep supply chains? Think about the dairy industry for a second. All the inputs going into there to produce proteins, whey for cheeses, different infant formulas, you know, all these higher end uh, processes and products that are coming out of the dairy industry. They're going to need a feedstock going into that whole process as well. So where does that really fit in? Okay, they wired down tomatoes and lettuces, uh, some strawberries and a, feather, a few other greens. But when it comes, push comes to shove, we're going to need grains included in this. So if you're forward thinking enough, you're going to go for the target part of the plant, which is the head. Try to remove the stalk. And this is where the Agricultural Institute of not only the Netherlands, different parts of Europe, but think about Taiwan as well. They have a huge plant breeding program over there and agricultural research, gene splicing, and the fruit industry is just top notch the way they've crossed a, a bunch of different fruits to get more natural sugars inside there. But at the same time, they were experimenting with target heads on the plants with no stems. That way you could do it hydroponically or indoor. Think about all the time and you know energy expended to grow the stem of any target species. If you can remove that, get it to go mini style or dwarf variety and just have a tiny little stem and a giant head coming off there. That's what this research is all about, trying to bring grains indoor with target species. So for instance here, with the capital expenditure of millions of dollars to build these facilities out, I mean, really, how much lettuce is that for an ROI? Yeah, if your restaurant business is pumping, your cities are full of people, this is possible. But the yields coming out of this, minimal. You're not going to feed any type of population with that. You know, scaling it up a bit, having different piping systems. Still, we're at the lettuce stage of things. Now, bringing it into the more automated, as we see here, the grow lights are moving trays. Singapore's been doing a lot of research with this, trays moving around, automated, water delivery, nutrient delivery, all through the mix, computer controlled, dialed in to the nth degree on what those plants need in terms of growth medium and light. All automated. Now we're taking the step up as to where China starts to come in to be, well, the leader of production of stuff. And I'll just leave it at stuff around the planet. And you know what I mean. So bring it up here to large greenhouse facilities. And we're talking so many tens of millions of dollars to build these out and get them up and running and put all the equipment inside. But how much food do you think that will produce for either cattle, chicken, pig, or humans? Not really enough to even feed a city. And then, you know, there's a lot of these different ideas with the futuristic projections and ideas, uh, what we could do as a society. And it's all great. And I'm glad the, the research in minds and people are thinking ahead like this. But realistically, one massive hailstorm would wipe that facility out. And then we come back to the Dutch again. And here's what they're envisioning for parking garages. Although this needs to be automated and light systems put in, the infrastructure is already built out for you and all these disused office spaces that we're seeing with all the commercial real estate collapse, that as well. Now, so the Chinese are up to some massive plans here. It's about if Jack Ma and Alibaba can create the software to run all these systems, not only would you have to pay the usage fee, but Chinese factories would still produce all the infrastructure like we see today. It's the world's factory. 
So now we got two powerful things connecting in history at a time when food insecurity is going to drive government policy, the economy, the reset of the economy, and so many other things through our lives. And then here it is at this pivotal point, all these things, China in the middle of the food system, all automated, just a little coincidental on the timing. But take a look at some of these other drawings here of what could be expected in terms of taking a city into self-sufficiency for food production. Kind of looks like a driving range that you would see in a city. You go to Singapore, you get multi-level driving ranges, etc. But here's where the rubber meets the road, literally. The whole reason Jack Ma was tasked with heading over to Europe to find out what's going on on the innovation side of agriculture and the automation side of it is Alibaba has China's largest AI research facilities and cloud computing, computer programming, and big data. Big data for you and me in China means social credit score. So now lump all these together, what do we get? Clear messaging that Alibaba has all the infrastructure to run all automated systems, and Jack's been tasked with going it because the Chinese government can't seem to be going out in public by asking and doing these same exact things. I love the cover story of a disgraced billionaire. Works perfectly. But if you're going to leave your name in China, history and legacy, it's going to take something more than owning a big expensive company. This will be it. Because I didn't know how much money was really going into AI, machine learning, cloud services, and big data into agriculture and automated agriculture. Until I started reading over places like Enterprise Irregulars, I mean, there's an enormous amount of billions of dollars flowing right into this. And if any projections are on par here, I mean, we're looking at a trillion dollar industry with just in a couple of years. So how much would that play into automated food production? I think quite a lot. So what is termed as ultra precision agriculture? And you notice no humans are involved in this. And perhaps that's the plan all along. Because looking through history, you know these grand solar minimums cut population globally. I mean, we sit right now at the precipice of barely enough people to run the society as it is with a basic functionality to keep a society and civilization moving. People aren't going to work. People have chosen not to work. Things are to slow down in a trickle anyway. The supply chains is just the bare minimum of what we're scratching the surface of a dissolving of minimal facility functionality in the government, in uh, private sector, and all those things that make our lives comfortable. At some point, there's not going to be enough people that are going to show up to work at the electric power stations, for example, or at the train terminals or the unloading terminals where these trains then take the grains off and put them into a facility elsewhere, dairy production, your factory to produce goods that go out into your supermarkets and a myriad of others. At what point does it break down where there's not enough people? It won't matter because what we're seeing here with targeted agriculture, precision, our agriculture and all the robotics and everything you've seen come in in the last, what, 15 years? It's all been poised to take over where humans are leaving off right now. And the precision farming is going to head into drones too. Like how much technology time and an enormous amount of predictive programming we're seeing in movies about drones and what they're capable of. Fleets of drones, millions of them in fields and humans are no longer needed for most basic tasks or even intermediary level tasks. But then you're going to bring it up a level here to the indoor ag. Previous images saw that was a facility in Singapore that was rotating trays, automated fashion for delivery of nutrient and light to the plants. Well, now you're going to incorporate drones into this and look at the build out. Incredibly simple. It's like restaurant shelving, basic shelving, nothing high tech, load in the LED lights, which are fractions of a penny now compared to what they used to be. Put the drones in there computer control everything, and how many humans will you need? But harvesting is one thing. They haven't been able to wire out the harvesting yet. That's a more difficult task, as well as adding seeds to the trays when it first goes into the hydroponics and gets, well, the rock wool cubes and all these other things, you know, robots can move all that around once it's in play, once it's floating, once it's in the trays. But the drawbacks they're finding right now 
is loading of seed into the medium to get it into the, the tray, into the growth medium of the larger scale, the hydroponic facility itself. And then secondly, when it comes to harvesting, they have not yet found gentle enough robotic arms that can make uh, these decisions on what could be cut. Those are still human activities, but everything else in between automated. So a facility that had 200 workers now needs 10 or five, depending on what you're gonna be pushed as to be able to receive your pay, your carbon allocations and your social credit score moving forward because it gets into this feedback loop. The companies that are using seed stock in this are gonna bring it up to seed, I'm sure. That seed will be 100% controlled, patented, and any food coming out of those facilities will probably fall into this. They'll be selling it by the calorie and it'll be associated with some sort of carbon allocation, carbon output, and then your social credit score as we march forward with all this digital identity thing. And you can see that feedback loop getting real nasty real fast where everything grown, you'll have to be in a system to track and trace it. Wild foraging vegetables will be a thing of the past. And all the food coming into cities will be grown in this fashion. So where does that leave us? Who controls this industry will control the world. Who controls North Africa and the Sahel as the new growing area coming online in our world will also control the next century. Funny how China's in both spaces in both places. So here's where it gets real interesting with yields and mechanized farming where the intersection of both bring you to the highest yield with fully automated systems, except like I said, where humans are needed to inoculate the medium with the seed and then harvest the plants. Now this is a fully autonomous system here, aside from those two things. This is a robot that comes along and picks up these thousand pound trays and moves them into the correct positions, rotates, puts a light on them. And you got to check this out. It's so science fiction. It's a Star Trek machine in real life here. And I was just fascinated. So I left the links below in the description box. So you can go and check out all these innovations that are here right now. And the Dutch Agricultural Institute's involved with all of them. And I really understand why Jack Ma's there on behalf of the Chinese government, because this is the latest tech coming out. Now, change the target species. What would you change to to keep our civilization alive? How could you scale this? And what disused buildings are there around the planet to bring up these facilities? Because look how much food in a square foot is being growing. This is massive. You know, none of that really spread out stuff in pipes on this you know, hydroponics is going to be the way to go. Obviously it is. And here's the robotic arms I was referring to that can move the rock wool cubes or the medium cubes around and move the trays around and do all that. But they can't put the seed in or harvest it. They're not that good yet. But look at the dual cameras. They're using different kind of infrared, checking for diseases, just an enormous amount of things that human eyes can't even perceive that these cameras outside our visual range are digging into in terms of getting the highest yield in the shortest amount of time. Now, here's another wild card that we're going to need to look into. Micronutrients in superfoods delivered to you in a small, tiny package, including protein. So it wouldn't go outside the realms to think of a protein cube squeezed with all of these micronutrients into something that you might see out of Star Trek. You press the button and a little cube comes out and that's enough for your meal for the day. So why do I mention this? Because you know, this is wheat grass or some type of barley grass coming out. Now, this has a dual purpose, in my opinion, here. The, the micronutrient superfood that can be done with these types of grasses, look into it. It's highly nutritious. Now, you could use Moringa, Oleifera, or Gynura. Gynura is another one that's not in any of those photos that I think could be a really um, high on the list target species for me, at least, if I was going to go the hydroponic route, Gynura and Moringa, Oleifera. Now, Moringa is more of a, a tree-based species, but Gynura fits that lettuce profile perfectly. Now, also, what do you see in the picture here? I'll flash back for you. These trays, what are these trays full of anyway? Well, they matted seed on the bottom of that, and that's what you're getting is this mat of root and seed. And this is a well-known hog and chicken production. They eat these cubes. They just roll them out right in. They throw the green fodder right out there. Now, if you're going to try to scale it to 8,000 cows, eight, let's say you have a, a, a herd, 800 or yeah, 8,000 
herd in your dairy herd. You know, to scale this up where you could feed 8,000 cows fodder by using and sprouting the seed into these dense seed trays that then roll out into a superfood for the cattle or a superfood for the turkey or whatever it could be, chicken, pork, poultry, swine industries. You know, you're thinking about density of delivery in the mechanism. So when you're looking at this, I highly encourage you to look at how to get these seed trays to sprout out. It only takes a very, you just have to poke a bunch of holes in the bottom of a, a plastic tray like that, lean it a little bit angle so the water can drain out. And it, it's just, you can pour it at the top and it runs through and drains out the bottom. These come up in about six days, six to seven days to produce what you're seeing here in this image. And then knowing that, this has been used to feed animals, goats, sheep, everything during the winter time at the small homestead level. So how do you bring it up into commercial level to provide the same nutrient density that I'm talking about for human delivery? Small little tiny pill, protein packed, micronutrients with superfoods included in it. So one or two or three of those is enough to keep you alive three meals a day. Take it into the animal industries as well. Animal husbandry, cattle, dairy, like I said, all those that involve in animals, they're going to need the same kind of dense package in a very small amount to deliver the most nutrients to them as well. This is what you're looking at on these trays right here. That's why they're there. Jack is figuring this out to bring it back and unveil it to the world through Chinese production. Like I said, their software will be involved. And I'm wondering what, at what point would you know, push come to shove, and then software automation would be cut off to a major facility somewhere in the West, and then your food production would go down. So again, you know, whoever controls this tech, it's a blessing for humanity. But at the same time, whoever controls this tech could thumb screw you into the ground by cutting off the automation end of it after it's, you know, tweaked and running at perfection, you're getting a huge amount of output. But then what kind of political pressure does that give back to the person who has all of this software, big data, AI, and everything else involved in it, along with the manufacturing and distribution of all the equipment involved in this too, is kind of a plug and play package included with all the software and everything you need to run the facility. And then you get into the consulting and the engineering side. Hmm, who would control that? Well, America doesn't have any factories to build this stuff out. Europe doesn't have any factories to build this stuff out. Africa doesn't have any factories to build it out. Australia doesn't either. So gee, who do you think's left that's gonna control this entire landscape of indoor vertical and indoor hydroponic food production moving forward? Alibaba. Answer is quite simple. It's being set up for the world's largest food play right in front of you. Now that's going to be on the automated side and, and you know talking about industry level but if we bring it down into the neighborhood or individual family home here you go an enormous amount of production coming out of the smallest possible space this is very similar to ted mark children and the omega garden which i also have one of those thank you very much ted for allowing me to borrow it and use it this year to put gynura in it that's my target species. I'm going to be growing gynora in the Omega Garden. But we see something kind of similar here coming out of China. Central light that the plants are brought around the light. This all requires automation and big data to run as well. So you have it from the family unit. Now you think American factories are going to produce this. And everything's been consolidated in China for manufacturing. So, you know, if we need to start a society again... How long will it take to get our steel mills back up? You know, something like this is plastic injection molding to bring up some sort of indoor agriculture would be probably a better go than aluminum smelting. But then you're going to need all these other metals included in, in these uh, processes. So, you know, China's going to dominate this space and you see where it's going. So what would your target plant be, do you think? You know, leave some comments in the description box below on what you think might be used to give us the protein source in a plant variety to be able to, you know, like I say, for dairy industry, cattle industry, uh, and everything else that we have from pigs, turkeys, chicken, whatever it would be, and humans, 
because the lettuce that's being grown right now just isn't going to do it. It's got to, you know, ramp up substantially in different species grown. The, the new global paradigm is not going to be about the petrodollar and energy. It's going to be about an agro dollar, an agri dollar. That's going to have the basis of wealth of asset class that'll give something value in the future. You're going to think about storable foods. I would. My Patriot Supply and Adapt 2030, the three-month emergency food supply, 25-year shelf life. That link's in the description box. Because these next two years, three years, are going to be all about food, 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 inflation, food, food prices, and food non-availability. Get it while you can now. Because every sign across the planet's blinking bright red saying we got a huge problem. I don't know. I'll leave it up to you to decide. Thanks for watching. Hope you got something out of the video. And I'll see you next time.